Hello, it's Sarah from Heart Cover Hearts, and I'm here with my favorite books of 2020. I know you may be saying, but Sarah, it's re it's already in February. What are you doing? And uh, I'm late because I wanted to ruminate a little bit more, and I really tried to fit <laughs> to fit the model that most people do, where they do like the top ten, and I just couldn't. And so I'm saying, forget it. I'm not worried about that. I've grouped my books that I, I can't stop thinking about and that I I want to say something about into kind of sections and genres uh, so that I could talk about them and share them with you. But before I do that, I wanted to say a special welcome to anyone who's come over here from Doris's channel. So Doris at Aldi Books is doing this really lovely thing this, this month. Uh, she does it every month, but it's this uh, mid-month book bash where it's kind of like an extended um, readathon, you know, kind of challenge. And she has a bingo um, card that she, that's going along with it. And she generously put me and this channel as one of the bingo cards, uh, asking people to come over, watch a video, maybe leave a leave a note. So I thought this might be a good time to kind of familiarize somebody who maybe not doesn't know me and also to do this for the people who have been following me for a while. So if you're new, welcome. And I do hope you leave a comment below. I answer all the comments and really excited to have you join. All right, so let's just get into it. Because like I said, there's so many books. Okay, so I have my notes here. The first section, the first grouping I put together is like literary fiction and works in translation. Uh, I read a ton. These are the ones that have stood out in my mind. Can't stop thinking. First up, <sighs> The brick of a book that almost took me the entire year to read, Dex Newberry Port by Lucy Ellman. Uh, this was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. I really wish that it had, it, had, it had won. I cannot stop thinking about this woman. I feel changed after the experience of reading it. Uh, I, I joke that she prepared me for Proust, uh, that being in the stream of conscience of this woman in Ohio as she's ruminating about her life and her worries and her fears uh, and thinking about pop culture and all these other things just became such a part of my life that I can't stop thinking about it. Uh, it took a long time to finish this. For those of you who watch my channel, you'll know how often I had to pick it up, but it was worth it. It was worth taking it slowly, uh, it, reading and scribbling in the book and just enjoying myself with it. Uh, and I, like I said, I read differently after reading this book. It had a profound impact upon me. Next up, Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli. Uh, I read this for the Book Two Prize and had heard mixed reviews, so I went in with really low expectations, and I bawled my eyes out. This book was a cathartic release, at the same time intellectually stimulating, uh, challenging, interestingly constructed, uh, and and I felt like it was very intelligent while also being heartbreaking. The story of a family of four, um, mother and a father and the two children who are traveling from New York to the Midwest. Uh, they, The mother and the father have been working on a project together. They are uh, in, involved with recording, recording sounds. Uh, meanwhile, the mother has befriended a family and in back in New York, and one woman, her two young daughters were coming over, crossing the border, and were picked up, and she doesn't know where they are. And so it's almost this this search for these little these little girls as this family is coming through, and she can't she can't stop thinking about them. Uh, I, I found this haunting. I still think about it. It was very emotional for me. Loved it. Next up. Uh, a Quickie Mezis, The Death of Vivek Oji. This one I read just one of the very last books of the end of the year, which is another reason why I like to wait a little bit because otherwise I would have missed putting this on the list. Uh, this is a very slim novel, very quick paced, and it's a beautiful, beautiful story set in an imaginary city in Nigeria where a where we open the story and a, the body of of a son is put at, at the doorstep of the mother and um, and she doesn't understand why her son was killed and it's an exploration of that. Uh, it's beautiful, beautifully rendered, loved it. 
Then for the book two prize, I also read Boy Swallows Universe by Trent Dalton. And this one blew my mind. Uh, it's a child narrator and it's very adventurous and boisterous and wild. There's a little bit of magical realism in, involved. And it's a story of a young boy whose family are uh, skirting the law in many ways. Um, and he wants to help his mother get out of this bad cycle. And so he, in his childlike mind, uh, decides to go up against these drug dealers and he wants to be an investigative reporter. And his best friend and, and caretaker slash babysitter is an ex-con who is famous for a bank robbery. Uh, it's kind of the underbelly. It's set in Melbourne and just really, really interesting. The pace was fantastic. It was very propulsive. Loved it. Then uh, let's go to the next one, Hamnet. This is by Maggie O'Farrell. This one stole my heart. Talk about grief. Uh, uh, what I loved about this is that we, it, we're talking about the family and specifically the wife of William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare kind of retreats into the back. He is called different things at different points of the novel, but it's really the story of his wife and her and her establishing her own and, and her own sense of her place when when he is kind of left, left at the town to go to London to become this famous playwright. And then what happens and how they, she grieves and, and come survives, I should say, the death of their son, Hamlet, of which the play Hamlet was written. Beautiful writing, very cinematic. Uh, I love the characters, thought it was absolutely brilliant. Next up, also dealing with grief, The Prettiest Star by Carter Sickles. Oh, this one was so real. It took me back to a place and time that I remember very deeply because I have people that have been impacted and affected by the AIDS crisis. This is a story of a young man who left home, left his Ohio town to live in New York City, fell in love, and, and uh, his lover died of AIDS, and he has come home to also die of AIDS in this small town and the ripple effect that that happens in this town. Uh, the prejudice, the fear, the homophobia. Powerful, very real, very emotional. Loved it. Thought it was fantastic. Next up, Girl, Women, Other. Uh, not only did it win the uh, the Booker Prize uh, co-winning, but we won't talk about that, for in 2019. It also won the Book 2 Prize last year, of which I judged, and this was my number one book. Uh, this is a phenomenal multi-perspective book of all of these uh, interwoven stories of women, uh, black British women living all over the all over the world with dynamic voices, very interesting stories, very different. Um, and I just felt like it was rich. It was a rich tapestry, loved every second of it. Uh, then a book, I, I swear I have mentioned this book so many times to people. Uh, what, one of the most, one of the ones I comment most about, this is Kim Ji Young, born 1982 by Cho Nam Jo. Uh, this is translated by Jamie Chang. Fantastic. I read this with Celia, uh, and I'll put a link to her channel below. This is a story of uh, genera uh, a woman, but also her mother and her grandmother telling her story as she grows up and deals with the sexism in the world. What's so brilliant is it's very cleanly written. It's very sparse, but interspose are footnotes uh, to counteract the arguments that, oh, this doesn't happen. And so it's actual st statistics and data about what she's talking about that backs it up. I thought it was remarkable fantastic book. Highly recommend. Then, uh, as I, met, I mentioned, uh, this, this gentleman, this is one of the very few men that exist on my, on my, uh, on my TBR. I mentioned already uh, Trent Dalton, um, and, this is, and also Carter Sickles. This is the preeminent, uh, most, most magnificent Marcel Proust, this is The Way by Swans, also known as Swans Way, which is the first volume in the In Search of Lost Time uh, series. I'm reading this with my very dear friend, Leo, of A Little Book Life. I'll put a link to his channel below. Uh, magnificent, ethereal, 
beautiful. This is a perfect thing to read during the pandemic because it really forces you to have attention and to follow along and the beauty of the writing. Uh, this was uh, translated by Lydia Davis and just magnificent. Cannot cannot say more high things about, about this. It's a reason it's a masterpiece. I, I do recommend, uh, but know that you'll need to focus your attention as you read it. Then I read Emile Zola's uh, Therese Raquin. This is a, a novel, a backlisted book, but in French, famous French literature, and it feels so modern. It's a story of a young woman who was taken in by, uh, by her aunt and raised up to be the companion to her cousin who has been sickly. And she's, in essence, kind of always assumed to marry him. She does, and they end up moving to Paris with the, the mother-in-law slash aunt. And everything starts to to close in on this family and all sorts of difficult things start to happen when she takes a lover. I will leave it at that, but just know it is, it is a, one of those books that palpable. Uh, then the artificial silk girl, this is by Irmgard Coyne. This book I read as part of the read more German books project, uh, put on by Mel at Mel's book and adventure and Britta Bowler. I'll put a link to their channels below. I did not read as many German books as I wanted to, but I have I have bought them, so I will be just continuing on with them because uh, it was a fantastic project. This book is about a, a young, silly, um, very superficial uh, party girl in, in uh, Germany in the 1920s and how her life changes with the onset of war. Fantastic book. Now let's switch to uh, nonfiction. So this is nonfiction. So we have some essays, we have some diaries, memoirs, letters, the whole nine. So let's kick it off with one of the most magnificent books I read last year. Also can't stop talking about this. Square Haunting, Five Women, Freedom, and London Between the Wars by Francesca Wade. This is such a phenomenal book. What Francesca Wade has been able to do is identify this one square in London where five amazing women lived. Uh, those women were H.D., who is the modernist poet, Dorothy L. Sayers, Eileen Power, Jane Harrison, and Virginia Woolf. Now, you may be like me, and you only recognize maybe one or two of those names. Uh, I went in trying to find out more about Dorothy L. Sayers because Gowdy Knights is one of my favorite mysteries ever. And I wanted to know more about Virginia Woolf. So this is me kind of tipping my toe into the into the Virginia Woolf water. Uh, but this book, it delivers. I'm not sure if you can see all of the tabs <laughs> that that I did. I actually read this from with Elizabeth from Bookish North. I'll put a link to her channel below as well. And we devoured this. We were amazed at all the things that we didn't know, all the interconnections of interesting people and how she was able to bring this one square in London to life. And this is all kind of interwar, interwar period, which is also a fascinating period. Cannot speak more highly. It's so readable. It's, it just flows and comes to life. Talking about coming to life. I, this is another book that I it took me a long time, but I finished it. It's a it's a huge, huge book. This is The Midfords, Letters Between Six Sisters, edited by Charlotte Mosley, who is the granddaughter of Diana Mosley, uh, the third in the in the family. Uh, this is an intimate, very fascinating look at the at, at the at the Midford family. If you're not familiar, this is a very famous family in. England. I'm fascinated with them, a little obsessed, I will admit. And uh, they just lived at a point in time in history and had the cachet and entree into society such that they just, they knew everyone, uh, including Hitler, including Churchill, including Evelyn Waugh. Uh, the names go on and on and on. And this book really illustrates and, and, and with detail, with footnotes with the best types of, of historical contextual setting that I've read in a book, 
their relationships to the, each other and to their work for those who worked and also for for the world itself and what was happening. Phenomenal, phenomenal read. Cannot speak more highly of it. Then I read Old in Art School. This is by Nell Painter. Uh, this was an inspiring story of a woman who uh, kind of near retirement decides that she's going to change her entire career and she wants to fulfill a dream she's always had of being a painter. So she goes back to art school. It's astounding, so interesting, uh, her approach with new eyes, with older, wise eyes, uh, and the difficulty of learning something new, incredibly inspiring. Then I was also kind of still on a painting kick, and I read Night Street Women. This is uh, the official title. I have to read it because it's so long. Night Street Women, Lee Krasner, Elaine de Kooning, Grace Hardigan, Joan Mitchell, Helen Frankenthaler, Five Painters, The Movement, The Changed Modern Art by Mary Gabriel. Uh, this book is remarkable, remarkable. Uh, really talks about the modernist movement and how so many women were not just uh, uh, designated as the wives, the lovers, the friends, but were actually integral key members of this, of this group and all of their work and their struggles as they were working and how their careers uh, transpired and how they also supported and uh, spurned, spurned each other on. Fantastic book. Another fantastic book about a set of women was The Five, Untold Lives of the Women Killed by Jack the Ripper. And this is by Hallie Rubenhold. And I want to mention the women because they have been forgotten in history. It's Polly, Annie, Elizabeth, Catherine, and Mary Jane. And what she's been able to do is piece together what their lives could have looked like or were and, de de and removing that stigma that these women were prostitutes, uh, because in most cases, that is not the case, but they were incredibly poor. And what did poverty look like for women in that era? Fascinating. She really brings these, these people to life. And I'm, I'm astounded at her process. Okay, then uh, I mentioned how I got very excited after reading Square Haunting. And so uh, Elizabeth and I decided to continue with Virginia Woolf and we tipped our toes into a little bit, a few more toes and started to read A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. And it was remarkable. I don't know why I waited so long, but I'm glad I did. Virginia Woolf is just such a fascinating writer. Uh, she writes this beautiful essay that she actually gave at Oxford about uh, the needs of what, what do women writers need? And she said, it's a room of their own and their own money. And, but the way she arrives at that conclusion and the way she takes you through as she's talking about this, as she's pondering this is outstanding. You, you get why she's so brilliant. Which also le then led to the third book that we read together, which was A Writer's Diary, being extracts from the diary of Virginia Woolf. Uh, again, so many things to talk about, and I just feel so intimately connected to her after reading this diary. And I appreciate that this diary is not her full diary, it's just about her work. It's about her as a writer. This is a Persephone book. I cannot recommend it more highly. Uh, this is number uh, 98. Then one of my favorite, favorite writers, uh, released a book, and it's Recollections of My Non-Existence, Rebecca Solnit. This is the UK edition. Uh, what she's done here is a little counterintuitive. She's written a memoir of all the times that she has been erased from her own life, uh, diminished, pushed aside, um, and it makes a fantastic look at how women are diminished and how in her specific life, People have tried to, to slow her down, to push her aside, uh, to not recognize her. Uh, well, they made a mistake. <laughs> Next up, wonderful, wonderful little essay collection. Uh, this is Zadie Smith, Intimations. And I fully come into, my, into the realization that I prefer Zadie Smith's essays to her fiction. And uh, this one absolutely marked that in place. Uh, it's just absolutely remarkable. There's so many uh, great things in here. Uh, this is something she wrote during the pandemic 
and it feels relevant. It feels very fresh. And she talks about the state that we're in. She's remarkable. Last up in this group is Angela Davis's Are Prisons Obsolete? I wanted to understand the prison abolitionist movement a little bit more because I couldn't conceptualize it. Well, she breaks it all down and talks about how prison is just pushing the problem away. It doesn't address and identify this, the societal problems, challenges, and ills. And there are other means and other ways to deal with it. And that's what she talks about here, as well as uh, the, the industrial complex that has grown up around the prison system uh, and how people are profiting off of the misery that, again, is not serving us as a society. Phenomenal book, very easy to read, very accessible. So that was my first set. I'm going to do a second video, and in that video, I'll talk about my backlisted and classic favorites, as well as historical fiction and mysteries. So I hope you come back and watch that one as well. As usual, I like to, to end by saying uh, we are still in a global pandemic, so please, please, please maintain safe social distance when you go out. Wear your mask. Wear two. That's the new, new thing. Wear two. Uh, wash your hands and don't touch your face. Thank you so much for watching. I'll look forward to talking to you in the next video. Let me know, have you read any of these books? And if so, what did you think? Thank you.